everyone. Uh, I'm Venitra, and I'm here on behalf of the Onyx engineering team to give you an exciting talk about machine learning with Onyx. But before we get started, I just wanted to see who's in the room. How many data scientists do we have here? Uh, machine learning engineers, enthusiasts, people here for the food, <laughs> all of the above. Great. Um, I'm going to give you a quick agenda of what we're going to go through, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So we're going to start off with an introduction to Onyx, what exactly it is. Actually, how many, how many of you have heard of Onyx before? A few. That's actually, that's great. So you'll have some exposure, and for the rest of you, we'll give an in-depth introduction into Onyx, the principles of our technical design spec and why we created it. Then I'll hand it off to Pranav, who will go more into depth into Onyx Runtime, which is our inference engine for Onyx models. And then we'll talk about production usage at Microsoft, and then go to a demo of how to get started with Onyx and some object detection models we've been playing with. So to understand why we're even working on Onyx, we first want to start by understanding the scale of machine learning at Microsoft. So it, it all starts with when we started integrating AI into our product suite. And right now at Microsoft, I think we have over 180 million monthly active Office 365 users. So if you've ever gone to PowerPoint and hit that little design ideas button, or if you've tried one of our new translation features while during a presentation, you can translate an auto caption in a separate language. Or if you're interested in some of our Outlook capabilities, all of those kind of fall under that bucket. Um, there have been 18 billion questions asked on Cortana. And in fact, over 6.5 trillion number of signals analyzed daily by Windows Defender and our virus protection services that are feeding into machine learning models. So in the scale of millions, billions, and trillions, we have to find some way to do machine learning at scale. And what we found is that we've integrated machine learning into pretty much every aspect of our stack from HoloLens to Xbox, from Bing to Office 365, from Windows to Skype, it's all there, and you'll see it coming out in all of our newest products. But since it's on all of our products and kind of becoming more and more of a big thing at Microsoft, we see that there's some real deployment challenges uh, at scale. Namely, we have a lot of different engineers, and each of these engineers and data scientists want to use their own separate training framework. We've seen actually over six frameworks in production, uh, which is a lot, but perhaps even more if we dig deeply into each of our different products and stacks. Now, this wouldn't be a problem if we didn't also have to deploy to many different deployment targets. So we have deployment targets like CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, IoT Edge. Um, and so the problem arises when each engineer wants to use perhaps a different framework and we want to deliver the best experience for our customers and our product users, so we want each of them to be optimized for each of these different deployment targets. And if you think about it in that front, because it's a matrix, you'll see how much sheer amount of work needs to go into delivering a really performant model on each of our different frameworks for each of our different deployment scenarios. So it's clear that there really should be some kind of standard in the middle that optimizes for efficient inference. And that's where Onyx comes into the picture. So there are four main characters that might be interested in using Onyx. Specifically, if you're a data scientist, you might be interested in using whichever framework you prefer and deploying to whichever deployment target you would like. If you're a hardware vendor, so someone who's working on edge devices or creating chips, you might want to support models from many frameworks by just implementing one standard. If you're a service author, you want to be able to create a model that you can deploy to any of these different devices. And if you're an ML engineer, you might want to run models on the devices you prefer um, instead of optimizing your model for each of those uh, different frameworks and devices. So that brings us to what exactly is Onyx? Onyx stands for the Open Neural Network Exchange. It's an interoperable standard for AI models. And the idea is that Microsoft got together with uh, a lot of our other community partners, specifically starting with Facebook originally. So Facebook had this need where they were working on both Cafe and PyTorch. 
And they needed some way to tie their two development teams together, and they had models across the company used in various stacks. And we said, this is a problem we definitely also see. So Onyx was founded with Microsoft and Facebook originally. And now we have three other founding partners, which are Amazon, NVIDIA, and Intel on our larger steering committee, and over 26 other companies that are part of our uh, consortium and ecosystem. And Onyx specifically consists of two main things. It consists of an intermediate representation layer, so a way to represent these deep learning and machine learning models, and a full operator spec. And what this means is we want to define our operators in such a way that they're all in the same standard, even though each of these frameworks have different sets of operators in them. The other really great thing about Onyx is that it's all open source. We have recently released an Onyx open governance spec where we have our five steering committee partners, which are Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, Intel, and NVIDIA. And we also have a lot of different special interest groups. So specifically groups that work on architecture, on operators, on converters, and working groups that are working on research arms of Onyx, like implementing training with Onyx or implementing Edge and mobile. So if you're interested in helping with development for any of these, you can join our team on GitHub and start contributing right away. We also have another really exciting piece of news to share. As of the end of last week, Onyx actually joined as a graduate member of the Linux Foundation. And what this means is that Onyx has a certain level of maturity compared to some of the other projects, and we want it to be agnostic to our different vendors. So by hosting Onyx as part of the Linux AI Foundation, we'll, we're able to further support Onyx for many semesters and years to come. How do you get an Onyx model? How do you even start with this process? So there's a couple of ways to do it. One, you can go to the Onyx model zoo. The Onyx model zoo is an area of all of these kind of different state-of-the-art models that have been trained in the various training frameworks, so Keras or PyTorch or TensorFlow. Uh, and we've converted those models to Onyx and housed them in the Onyx model zoo, which is on GitHub. You can just pick one up and get started right away. Or you could use model creation services, such as Azure Custom Vision or various others. And the idea here is that you build your model you feed in a data set through a service, you get a model at the end, uh, and those creation services output the model in the Onyx format. Alternatively, you can convert an existing model of yours from a different framework. So we have a variety of frameworks that we support and more adding on every day. Um, so those include popular frameworks like CNTK, CoreML, Scikit-Learn, TensorFlow, Keras, Cafe2, the gamut of them. And Another alternative is you could do end-to-end -end model training with systems like Azure Machine Learning or various other cloud service providers that work in this area. So we actually provide a whole set of converters for open source conversions for you to get started with your own models that you've trained in other frameworks. And these include, of course, all of the ones that I mentioned above, but also an interesting native export feature in CNTK and PyTorch. What native export means is something that I'm going to elaborate on shortly. So if we take a look at this quick example, we see that you've trained your model in PyTorch, you load your model weights with model.pt, and soon after that, you want to convert your model to Onyx. All you have to do is use the torch.onyx module, so it's already implemented on the torch side to convert your model to Onyx with this simple export function. Alternatively, you could do the same for Chainer, you could use the Keras to Onyx converter, or you could use the TensorFlow to Onyx converter. And honestly, the theme that's running across all of these is that the code that you see to convert models is not very long. It's quite short, and it actually could save you a lot in terms of inference and in terms of interoperability. If you wanted to convert your model to a different framework and use something new in that framework, or if you wanted to deploy for efficient inference like we do at Microsoft, Onyx is a great way to get started. So when we were trying to design a common standard for a way to represent all of these different machine learning models from all of these different frameworks in a way that enables interoperability, we followed a few main design principles. These design principles are as follows. First, we wanted to make sure that we were able to represent both deep learning models and machine learning models. 
So this means that we have to create two sets of operators and specs and operators surrounding topics like convolutions or ReLU or things like that. Um, and we'll dive more deeply into what exactly those two operator specs are. We wanted it to be interoperable in the sense that if you convert a model to Onyx, we wanted you to be able to either export back to your native language, export to a different language, and be able to essentially not lose information as you're translating between these. We wanted it to be backwards compatible. And this is especially important because we're targeting models that are deployed to production. And so when you deploy something and you release a new version of an operator, you don't want everything to break in a future version when people are already starting to use older versions. And we wanted compact and cross-platform representation for serialization. So what that means is essentially we just want files that represent our models that are really efficient and able to be used across all of the different operating systems and platforms that we can deploy machine learning models on. And lastly, we also wanted to make sure we support versioning. So someone can tie their model to a working version of our packages and our spec, and so they can actually use these in production scenarios. So going into more detail on our operator spec, there are three main topics that we want to cover in terms of components. The first is that we want an extensible computational graph model. What this means is that we want to define some kind of a model format that represents our nodes, our operators, our inputs, and our outputs. We also need definitions of standard data types. And what this means is that we want some way to represent tensor types, some way to represent non-tensor types, and we'll go into more detail on that as well. And then thirdly, we want a definition of our operators. And these are kind of our schema sets and our operator versioning sets. Um, and these are the three main things that we want to define. So let's go into a little bit more detail on each of these. First, we're designing the Onyx model file format. So this nice visualization in the corner is called Netron. Uh, it's a way to represent machine learning and deep learning models. It's actually really fun to play with. So definitely want to give them a huge plug. But you can visualize Onyx models with Netron. Um, and Essentially, the three main components are as such. First, we want a model which has information about the version, information about metadata, and some way to represent this graph of computation. So you take your input, and you want to do these certain operations to it as you go through the entire model. The second thing we want to look at is the graph. So if the model is kind of the bigger, encompassing idea of what the end-to-end -end process of your deep learning information. Um, a graph just deals with the inputs and the outputs, the list of computational nodes, and it has a name individually as well. So a model is kind of the larger file. A graph deals with the specifics of um, how the nodes go through the process. And then the last part is the computational node. So at each node level, we have zero or more inputs from each of these defined types. We also have one or more outputs from each of these defined types. And each of the nodes correspond to operators, and they have attributes surrounding those operators as well. So the next thing I want to dive into is what are our supported data types? We have a couple here. The first ones are tensor types, and these are integers. Uh, unsigned integers, floats, doubles, full strings, complex integers, everything you can expect out of a traditional framework and things that you see commonly used across a lot of these different frameworks as well. But we also have some non-tensor types. So these are defined in Onyx ML. So we have two specs, one for deep learning and one for traditional machine learning. And these two tensor types are sequences and maps. We can go into more detail on that later if you have questions. But they're just essentially other ways to represent information. And the last thing, and perhaps the most important thing about Onyx, is defining a large operator spec. So this is an example of our ReLU operator. Essentially, this has been available since version 6 of our operator set. So this is one of our uh, most commonly used operators. And you can see that our spec defines an operator as follows. We have certain inputs, and we have descriptions of what those input constraints are. We have certain outputs, and we have descriptions of those constraints as well. And then we have examples and uh, some general description of the purpose of our operator. But specifically, they're defined by three things. They're defined by the name of the operator, in this case, ReLU. 
domain, in this case, ai.onyx, which is our deep learning domain, and version. And this versions are defined by which version of Onyx came out at a certain time, and we'll dive in more to that in the next slide. We have over 156 different ops supported in our deep learning spec, and 18 in our traditional machine learning spec, and of course, they're interoperable across both. Um, all of these ops are supported by Onyx compatible products, and generally, each of these operators cannot be more meaningfully decomposed. As in, these are things that we've all heavily debated from all of our different companies and gone through each of the operators that have been proposed and introduced in each of these new frameworks and decided this is something that we want to include in our Onyx spec and this is something we might want to save for next time. These two operators can be combined even though they're slightly different in each of our languages or libraries. We want to go with this implementation and why. And since all of this is open source, if you're interested in any of our arguments over any of these things, you can find them on GitHub. Um, there are many areas that are supported by our operators, specifically under image classification, under natural language processing, under object detection, image classification, things like that. Uh, and we have custom ops. So you might be wondering, okay, I have a model and that has an operator that hasn't been implemented in Onyx yet. I wanna convert my model to Onyx so I can use your great set of tools and your ecosystem. Um, how do I do that? First, you wanna find you want to define a custom operator, which you can do through our framework, and I think Pranav will touch on that a little bit more later on, or you can propose a new operator to the Onyx spec. So we have some, some areas within Onyx where you can define your own custom, custom ops as well. And now lastly, the, the second to last most important thing in Onyx is versioning. So we version across three different levels. One of them is our intermediate representation layer, which is how, which is basically our file format. We're currently at version five of our file format, and so each of our releases can be tied to a specific IR version. We also version across opsets. So opsets are defined versions of our set of operators, and the reason that we version across those is that we have, let's say, new operators introduced, some operators deprecated, some operators changed, and every time we make a new release, we release a new version of our offset. And then lastly, we version across operators individually as well. So a given operator has a domain, which is ai.onyx or ai.onyxml for the two different deep learning versus machine learning um, operations. And then each of them have different operator types so this just means what's the name of the operator um, and operator versions, which means which offset was it originally released in. So let's say you had an operator, in this case ReLU, that was released in offset six. We've released up to offset 10 now. So in offset seven, eight, and nine, and 10, there have been no further updates to ReLU, and therefore um, it is constantly, its version for that operator is offset six. And through this process of versioning, you're able to identify exactly which operators have been released at which time and ensure that you are familiar with the implementation of your spec. If you want more details, you can read our versioning page on GitHub as well. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Pranav, who will talk more about our new inference engine that we've released recently and Onyx runtime in more detail. So you have an Onyx model now, which is interoperable. You have converted it from different training frameworks. And uh, now is the time to actually run the model. So where do you run the model? You need an engine to run the model. And that is where Onyx runtime comes into picture. So let's go through what is Onyx runtime. So it's a high performance inferencing engine for Onyx. It is completely open source. It is under the MIT license. All of the development happens on GitHub. There is absolutely nothing which is uh, private to Microsoft. Uh, it is cross-platform, so you can run it on Mac, Linux, as well as uh, Windows, of course. And uh, I think this is the only, so far we know, this is the only complete implementation of the Onyx spec. Let's talk about some of the uh, design principles around how we, what, what were the considerations when we were designing Onyx runtime. So one, one of the major considerations was that it has to be backwards compatible. Uh, in Microsoft, when you're deploying models in production, uh, especially in Bing and very high performance services, 
you can't be, uh, you have to run the service even when new model formats come in or when you're updating Onyx runtime libraries. So backward compatibility between Onyx models as well as the Onyx runtime versions uh, was a pre key primary concern. The other uh, most important aspect was, was obviously performance. And uh, to that end, uh, Onyx runtime is implemented in C++ and some parts of it are also implemented in assembler. So we have written our own uh, linear algebra library for math calculations. And uh, so we don't really uh, depend on, you can choose to depend on other libraries if you want to when you're configuring Onyx runtime. But for the most part, the library which we have written uh, works the best. So the other uh, important aspect of Onyx runtime is uh, support for hardware accelerators. So you could take an Onyx model which is completely independent of which deployment target you're going to run on. So, and through Onyx runtime, which can be configured with different hardware accelerators, you could run it on either a GPU, a Windows GPU, or a CUDA GPU, or a uh, NVIDIA GPU, or, you, or for example, you could run it on Intel's OpenVINO, or Cascade Lake processors, and different deployment targets. And the way these hardware accelerators are abstracted is through something called as execution providers, and we will talk more about it in detail in the next few slides. So, uh, and in, in order to support this, we have this concept of a hybrid execution model where not all parts of the graph can be implemented by the GPU or not all parts of the graph can be implemented by OpenVINO. And in that sense, the Onyx runtime has the capability to fall back uh, the execution on the CPU, which is the default uh, hardware accelerator. So let's go through the uh, architecture and how the model is, uh, is run inside Onyx runtime. So the first input which, is, which you're going to give is obviously the model, and uh, this is in the protobuf format, and Onyx runtime creates an in-memory model representation of, uh, of the graph. After this, it runs through a series of optimizations of the graph, and think of these as compiler optimizations which are at various levels, like O1, O2, and O3, so we have different graph optimization levels, L1, L2, and L3. At, at every level, and this is obviously configurable through the APIs, at every level, we go through different sets of optimization. So an example of, uh, of, an, L2, of an L1 optimization could be something like where you're trying to fuse uh, certain nodes. Uh, for example, you're trying to fuse uh, so one optimization is actually where we're trying to eliminate some of the nodes which are not really required for inferencing. So for example, dropouts, uh, unsqueeze, these are not really required for inferencing, so we try to remove them. Then we are trying to fuse some of the nodes like convolution and uh, activations, nodes are fused. And at some point, wherever we are trying to see opportunities where nodes can be fused into a single node, uh, we will try to do that. Once the optimizations are complete, uh, this is where we come the next part is the model partitioning phase. And this is the most important phase where in addition to the model, the input to Onyx runtime is also a set of prioritized hardware accelerators or execution providers where you want the graph to run on. So as of now, the, the partitioning algorithm is as follows, where Onyx runtime goes through the, the list one by one and it asks every provider to tell which parts of the graph you, you can actually run. And these graphs are marked with uh, saying that these are the different nodes or the subgraph which I can run on. And then it goes through the next execution provider to see whether you can run on these, uh, whether you can run the rest of the nodes. And by the end of the partitioning process, what you get is a graph which has been marked with all the different hardware accelerators which was configured at uh, Onyx Runtime API when you were calling the API. So once the partitioning is, is done, and actually this is, the partitioning is what enables you to run the model in a hybrid execution stage. So where some parts of the graph are running on TensorRT uh, CUDA implementations, some of them are running on the CUDA GPU ones, and some of them are running on, on CPU or even OpenVINO for that matter. The next phase is where uh, we go through another set of optimizations where we allow the individual hardware accelerators to optimize the graph even further because they have the best knowledge of, of the subgraph which they are running. So they have to know, so they can decide to know how to fuse the nodes in that graph. So this, these subgraphs are then uh, further optimized by individual execution providers and then uh, is the time to execute the model. 
Now think of Onyx Runtime as really a, uh, as an interpreter, where it is going through all the nodes one by one in the graph and, and running them and executing them. So there are two modes of execution at a very high level. One is sequential and one is parallel. Sequential is obvious when we go through the nodes one by one. In the parallel uh, execution phase, we try to see where how the topology of the graph is there. And if you see that the graph is, is mostly parallel in nature, we will try to utilize that and execute the graph in parallel. And you can still control this through the APIs, where if you want to explicitly run it in sequential mode, you can do so. You can also control how many threads you want to, uh, you want to configure for each mode of execution. So once uh, the execution is complete, uh, the results are sent out in the API. Now one important thing to note is that when you're talking about hybrid execution mode, you could have different devices interplaying uh, in the execution. And not all devices share the same memory. And hence, you have to insert the memory copy uh, nodes, and these are inserted based on the optimizations which we perform. So if the graph is running partially on the GPUs, we will insert uh, copy nodes in between different nodes to ensure that the data, the inputs are copied from CPU to GPU and back and verb. So this, so we talked about model partitioning, and then this is the execution provider, which is the interface to, uh, to every hardware accelerator. So more and more hardware accelerators are joining us and they're writing uh, the execution provider so that the Onyx graphs can be run on their devices. And we expose an API for them to do that. And this is the, the get capability API, uh, which says that, you know, given a graph, I will give me a subgraph uh, which you can run on. And then the other one is the compile uh, phase of the API, which, which is more talking about, uh, I, I cannot run I cannot identify individual Onyx subgraphs or Onyx nodes, but I can tell you that I can run a bunch of nodes together in, uh, as a subgraph. So it provides its own implementations of the operators. So we talked about graph partitioning, and uh, the current algorithm is actually greedy in nature because it is relying on user input. So the user has to specify a prioritized list of execution providers where the graph should be run on. And it, it's mostly relying on the user to say that, you know, you know best where you want to run the graph on, so you tell us where it should be run. However, we are exploring a different phase where we call it smart partitioning in the next release, where we will figure out for you uh, the, based on whatever execution providers you have asked us in the API calls, we will figure out what is the best way to place the graph on and how to run it most efficiently. So this is the graph optimization, and there are different levels which we talked about. So there is, we call, the, this is the internal data structure, the graph transformer. These are also registered through the APIs. Uh, so there are two ways to control it. You can either register your own graph transformer, or you can also control the level of the transformation which you want to run. So you can have level zero, level one, and, and level two. So far we have until level three, uh, but we haven't gone beyond that. So these are the different types of optimizations which are running. As you see, there is memcopy. This is the, uh, the artificial nodes which are inserted to ensure that the tensors are copied from CPU to GPU and back. And then there are a bunch of uh, these fusions which are taking place. For example, uh, there is also the shape to initializer, where if there is a shape node uh, in the graph, it is just converted into a weight. A weight is nothing but an initializer here. So this is the execution providers, uh, which is the, the software abstraction on top of the hardware accelerator. And here it shows that you have two types of them, which is the kernel-based, where a kernel is nothing but an implementation of an operator. These are written in the Onyx runtime code base, and they are checked into the Onyx runtime code base. The second type of execution provider is what we call as a runtime-based execution providers. This is where uh, the execution provider is really a black box for us. We really don't know what it is executing. And what we do is essentially we hand over the graph or parts of the graph to the provider, and it runs it for us. So classic examples of this are uh, TensorRT. Uh, there is also Intel's ngGraph. Uh, then there is there's also the Android NN API, where we just uh, we hand over, we serialize the graph, and we give it to the execution provider, which in turn runs it for us. So these are some of the performance numbers. Uh, these are a little bit old. 
but uh, you can see there is a significant performance number when you are seeing uh, tensor RT and n graph, and when it is run with the execution provider, you will get uh, much better performance. So, one of the other design principles was that we wanted to ensure that Onyx runtime is extensible, uh, and there are enough hooks uh, in the product which is which makes it possible for everyone to extend it. So, one of them is 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 execution providers, and for that we have the I execution provider interface. You implement the interface, and you are able to run on the Onyx graph on any hardware accelerator you want. The second one is custom operators, like Vinitra talked about, where you may not have all the operators in Onyx, and Onyx is, is in some sense, it is very, uh, there are a lot of companies which are involved, and we want to ensure that only the right operators get in. And sometimes you have faster release cycles, you don't have the time to wait for the Onyx operators to get published. So that's the time when you can implement your own uh, Onyx operators, and you can, imp you can register them with Onyx runtime through the APIs. And there are ways to do that. This is what we call as the custom ops. Then we have the graph optimizers, which I spoke before. Uh, this is where you can implement the graph transformer interface, uh, register the graph transformers, and uh, oops, yeah. So not all of these extensions are available in our C APIs. Uh, some of these are available in the internal APIs, and it depends on the uh, sophistication which you want from Onyx runtime. And you will use the appropriate API in that case. So here is our matrix. Uh, so we are on Windows, Linux, and Mac, uh, three versions of Python. Python 3.8 is out recently. We haven't updated yet. Uh, you have C, C++, C Sharp, and C. So the C APIs are ABI compatible, which means that you can install a different version, a higher version of Onyx runtime, and not worry about recompiling code. Then we have x86. Uh, some of these are available as uh, pre-built packages which you can download from NuGet or from the GitHub website. Or some of these, you will have to build it from the source. So for example, ARM64 is something which you will have to build from the source. But the builds are supported for these. Then we have different execution providers like TensorRT. DirectML is the, uh, is the Windows built-in uh, execution provider, which is based on DirectX. Uh, then we have mGraph. Uh, so NUFAR is a fairly new entry here. And NUFAR stands for model. Actually, I don't remember what it stands for. But it is, it, is, uh, it is based on the technology called TVM, where the model is compiled. Uh, it is not interpreted anymore one node at a time. And it is based on this TVM technology where the model is compiled into one executable which you run. So, it's a much, much faster version uh, of Onyx Runtime, and you can just use NUFAR uh, to run your models. Then we have uh, OpenVINO, which is also from Intel. So let's go through how the APIs look like. So, uh, so Onyx Runtime has, has essentially two, at, at a very high level, there are like two constructs where you create a session, and then you call run on the session. And the session is such that which you should be creating uh, only once in the process, uh, and it should be in a thread safe way. So, so we have the inference session. Uh, we create a session object, and we specify the model path. And we prepare the inputs. And then finally, we run session.run. And session.run is, is thread safe. Uh, you can run it in multiple threads. Uh, given a session object. The session object should be created uh, in a thread safe way before that. So we don't guarantee thread safety for the construction of the session itself. And that is, and in the construction of the session object is when all your optimizations and everything, the graph is actually prepared for running uh, in the most optimal way. This is the C API, and it is very similar. You have create session, and then you have run. And we also have different ways to specify the logging mechanism if you want the logger to go in a specific uh, in a specific file or in some other event. 
So the, the session creation is, is still, it won't, it depends on the size of the model, right? So if there are a lot of opportunities for optimization, what happens is, yes, those optimizations might take some time because each time a, two nodes are fused, the graph is, uh, we call something called as the graph resolution. The graph is resolved again to ensure that the graph is in the right stage, right? So it can take some time. However, the, uh, both this, the creation of the session and the run uh, it takes as input something called as run options and session options. And in the session options, you can specify that you would like to serialize the model after it has been optimized. So once it is serialized, then you should be able to reuse the same optimized model in, in the next few runs. And, that's it. and that would be a no-op operation, and that would be pretty fast for you. So this is the C-sharp version, and as you see, right, we have uh, followed a similar pattern where you just create the inference session, and then you call run on it. The next is the custom operators. So uh, this is actually, for some of our uh, customers, this was really very important internally, where they wanted to create a session, where they wanted to contribute certain operators to Onyx, but it wasn't, it wasn't meeting their release timelines, and that's the time when they started creating custom operators. And uh, this is the C version of uh, registering a custom operator. So you, you could write a custom op separately, uh, in, in your own application code and then register it with Onyx Runtime. There is also a Python version of it, we call it the PyOp, where you could actually uh, have the Python implementation of the operator and then registered with it. So a lot of our data scientists at Microsoft, they didn't want to write C++ code to implement the operators. And they, and they wanted to write the new custom ops in Python. And they said, how do we register something which I've written in Python with Onyx Runtime? And that's where we have this thing called is the PyOp. Uh, and you should be able to register a PyOp with Onyx Runtime. And just a few weeks back, we have released 1.0 version of Onyx Runtime, which means that and we are going to follow semantic versioning. Uh, no breaking of APIs anymore. So rest assured that once you have deployed Onyx Runtime 1.0, a newer versions will not break anything. Uh, we also support uh, all the way back to CentOS, grudgingly. But yes, there are customers who want uh, to use CentOS, and, there are, and they won't go away. They won't upgrade their Linux versions. Um, then this is, we have 1.6 compatibility. This is the latest Onyx version release. This is at Opset uh, 10, Opset 11, as of now. Uh, and then there are a few execution providers which we added, DirectML, NewFar, and also the ARM Compute Library. Uh, this is an interesting one because this, uh, even though we have implementations uh, for several math libraries in, in ARM it itself, the ARM Compute Library provided a much better uh, performance numbers, and that's why we tried to uh, add it back as an execution provider. And then we have something called as the Onyx Go Live tool. And so many of our uh, internal partners have suggested that uh, I have an Onyx model and I know these are the bunch of hardware accelerators where I can run on, but I don't know how to configure it uh, correctly. So that's why we said, okay, we will create a tool for you which will go figure out how to run the model best. And not only that, we will also convert the model for you in the process. So what it does is that it integrates model conversion. So you give a TensorFlow model or a PyTorch model, it converts it for you, it does the correction, and if the conversion is not correct, it'll, it'll return an error. And then, it, and then the most important step is the performance tuning, where it'll go and check every single hardware accelerator on your hardware, whether you have, uh, whether this is the right configuration. So should I run on CUDA on NVIDIA GPUs first, or should I run on the o Intel OpenVINO machines first, or, or should I just run on CPU? So this Onyx Go Live tool is also open source. Uh, you should be able to check it out on GitHub. Yeah, so, so far, looks like all theory. Yes, Onyx runtime is great. Uh, is it even getting used at Microsoft? So that's the next part of the story. Uh, we have, Onyx is actually used a lot in Microsoft, uh, and here are a few examples, where we have in Office, the missing determiner model is used for grammar and check correction, and you'll see it's a 14x performance gain compared to what they were using before. Then we have the optical character recognition model. 
This was a 3x performance gain. Uh, this is also used as part of the cognitive services. And then this is the Bing question and answer models, uh, where we have a 2.8x performance improvement. So these are live examples of our internal customers who are using Onyx, Onyx runtime, and Onyx converted models. And next, we see what's coming up next. So we have an API. It's kind of in, uh, in the PR currently. It's in preview mode, where you could run Onyx runtime on Android devices as well. Uh, the Java API is also in PR. Uh, you're welcome to contribute. Uh, so, and then we have something called as the training support. Uh, this is more exploratory as of now, where we are trying to see if Onyx runtime can be used to tune your models, right? This is not the full training, but when your model is already created, uh, can I tune the model to my own needs at the end? The last one, uh, yes, so we continue to, performance is really, really more, the, the most important uh, goal here. So we want to improve, continue to improve performance optimizations. And this is the demo now, the real action. <laughs> Let me do a quick demo of, uh, thank you to our wonderful audience member who came up with an adapter. Um, let me do a quick demo of how we can convert a core ML model as well as do some object detection with YOLO v3, which we've just implemented with Onyx and Onyx Runtime. So let's get started. Um, Essentially, the idea that we're trying to show here is that Onyx is versatile, Onyx runtime is efficient, and it might be useful in your use cases for either training or either uh, using inference on state-of-the-art models that require good performance, or going forward, if you're trying to support your model across different frameworks, across different areas, uh, it might be something that might be useful for you as well. So, um, in this case, we're going to take a quick look at YOLO v3. This is an object detection model that is state-of-the-art and very famous. Essentially, the point of YOLO is that um, it stands for you only look once. And so the idea is if originally in object detection, you're trying to identify two things. One, what are the objects in the image? And where exactly in the image are those objects? Uh, each of these cells predict five candidate bounding boxes. And through that process, you only have to pass through the entire image once um, to predict all of these different candidate boxes. And each of them have different confidence scores for how likely they are to contain uh, an object and also a classification on what that object actually is. So in this case, we identify a dog, bicycle, and car. And we're using a grid of 13 by 13 cells. This model was originally trained in Keras, but um, has been converted to Onyx through the Keras to Onyx converter. download the model, but I did do that earlier, so um, we're just not going to worry about it for now. And here we pre-process our data. We identify um, five classes from our Coco data set. And here we're starting to look at Onyx Runtime. So the way we initialize is we first create an Onyx Runtime inference session. We do a little bit of pre-processing in our image to get it to the right format for our YOLO v3 model. Um, and then we pass our information into uh, our session. Oh, let me see. So we see inference time takes 0.94 seconds. Usually it's actually a little faster than that. Um, but uh, we identify both the input, the two different input types, and then we can pass it in. Our inference run call is really easy, and uh, it's fairly efficient. So if we take a look at our YOLO v3 model, you can open it with Netron and see exactly what the inputs are and what the metadata is um, for that. Other than that, um, we want to post-process our model output, so we're going to take a look at that after this model opens. So we have three pieces of output from our YOLO v3 model. We first have um, boxes, and then we have candidates, and we have scores for each of them. And these are confidence scores that there are objects contained in these boxes. We do a little bit of post-processing to identify and extract that information. And we want to now display our candidate boxes. So this is just a small sample of our candidate 
boxes. In this case, we're displaying 300. And remember, each of those grid cells that we were looking at before predicts five candidate boxes, and each of those have certain scores. We get rid of everything below a certain threshold, but now we're just going to take a look at those boxes on top of our image of horses. And then we're going to display exactly our boxes here. Sorry. I Great. And now we've identified each of our um, exact images. And now if we want to do this with different classes, we can also do that. So let's take a look at a couple more images. And these are all running with Onyx Runtime in the background. We have Blue Angels, which are a favorite. Um, and we've just displayed, again, a random sample of the candidate boxes that we've seen and the identification. And again, we've seen pretty much they're all predicting the exact same um, candidate class. So we want to see an example where they're predicting more things. So let's take an image of our capital and a busy road on front of it. And we see the candidate boxes and our, our predictions. And they're all running on Onyx runtime. So we're able to implement functions for even our most popular and sometimes most complicated object, detections, object, object detection models. So you can see here. Um, this is Netron again, the uh, visualizer for neural network models. You see that uh, our model has certain properties, and it has a producer, which is Keras to Onyx. We know that it has a domain, and it has certain imports. We know exactly where what our input is called and what's in it. We know what exactly our outputs are, and we can see the scale of computation for YOLO v3, and it's very large because it's a very large and complicated model. Now let's do another quick, super quick demo. Um, so this notebook environment that I'm running in is called the Onyx Ecosystem Converter Container. And essentially what you can do is if you have a model or if you just want to poke around, we have a couple of inference demos and we have a couple of um, converter scripts where if you wanted to just upload your model, convert it from any of our different frameworks, it already has uploaded all of the different uh, imports and all of the packages, so you don't have to spend all of that time you know, downloading all of the correct packages and getting your environment set up and all of that. Um, you can instead just play around in a Jupyter Notebook server. So let's take a look. First, we're going to upload a model that um, I had selected previously, which was from CoreML, which is Apple's machine learning framework. Let me see if I can find it. There we go. So we'll take our document classification model and upload it here to our Jupyter server. And we'll go to our CoreML uh, notebook, which I've just opened. And you see a couple of things. One, we have CoreML tools, which is just to read our CoreML model. And then we have Onyx ML tools, which contains our CoreML converter. And Onyx as well, just to check our model at the end. So we've loaded that. And now we want to rename our CoreML model, because we know that it's our document classification model. So let's do that. So now we have our input CoreML model path and our output Onyx model path. And here, what we're doing is we're going to load our CoreML model. We're going to convert it to Onyx. We're going to save it as a protobuf, which is the file format of Onyx models and also of TensorFlow models and a, a set of others. And now we just want to check that our model is valid. So we're going to load our model back into Onyx and see that it's checked. But what we can also do is, now that we have our document classification model and our model.onyx, we can peek around at both of those um, in Netron and see the difference. And this is a really simple model. What it does is it takes news articles and classifies them in one of five categories. So we see two here. The one on the left is our Onyx runtime model. And we see that it has an input. Um, it keeps all the information that it's converted with Onyx ML tools. It classifies news articles into one of five categories. And it got that from the original Core ML model. Um, it's licensed by the MIT license. It even keeps the author name. Um, and here we have um, the exact same Core ML model that we were looking at earlier. So the only difference here is that the linear classifier has more attributes that are tied to it, and it parses through this in the uh, sequential executor way instead of parallel-wise. But it's a one-time cost to convert your model to Onyx, and as you can see, it went fairly quickly. 
sorry, this is the, the one on the, the, the one on the left is the Onyx model, and the one on the right is the CoreML model. So CoreML, Onyx. And uh, it keeps all the information in terms of the string vocabulary and things like that. And you can see that it's, they're both fairly efficient, um, and it's an easy process. So with that, uh, I guess we've covered a lot of really interesting things here today. Specifically, uh, we've covered the Onyx runtime, we've covered Onyx, we've covered why you would even want to use Onyx, specifically um, a lot of different uh, ways to convert from different frameworks into Onyx and why it's an interoperable standard and why more people are adopting it across our 26 companies. So we're excited to continue with the Q&A and uh, thank you for listening to us.